During the early days, whenever the Beatles were feeling depressed about where they were, both in terms of location and where the band was heading, John Lennon would often get their spirits back up by saying in a pseudo-American accent, Where are we heading, fellers? In which the others would shout back, To the top, Johnny! And John would respond with, And where's that? And they would shout, To the toppermost of the poppermost! Well, in 1964, it would seem the toppermost was in their grasp. The Beatles had told Brian Epstein that they would not go to America unless they already had a number one hit over there. They had seen so many other British artists like Cliff Richards who were popular in the UK but be absolutely destroyed whenever they went to the US. So they at least wanted to make sure they had a firm footing before they ventured over. Well, behind the scenes, George Martin and Brian Epstein were doing all they could to push the Beatles songs in America all the way through 1963. Okay, so EMI owned Capitol Records, one of the biggest music publishing firms in America. So George Martin decided that they would be the best option to publish the Beatles songs on the other side of the Atlantic. He had first sent them Please Please Me... Uh, That was the single version, not the album, when it was still topping the charts in the UK. But unfortunately, Capital turned it down, so Martin had no choice but to try the smaller labels, where the song just completely disappeared. The same thing happened when he tried From Me To You, and again with She Loves You. The reason for these rejections was that America saw British music as an inferior substitute to what they felt they had created in the first place, and if British artists were doing the same thing, they were either doing it wrong or were behind the times, as a new range of music was coming in called surfing music led by the likes of the Beach Boys. But Brian Epstein wasn't giving up. He had gone to New York to meet Sid Bernstein, a theatrical agent, to see what ways they could try and promote the Beatles. Bernstein was surprised by Capitol's continual rejections, so he had booked for the Beatles to play at Carnegie Hall on the 12th of February, and so the pair of them, with the support of Walter Hoffer, who handled Dick James' company in New York, personally appeared at Capitol with a demo of I Want to Hold Your Hand and insisted the release of it. Reluctantly, Capital agreed, scheduling its release for the 13th of January. However, someone else thought the Beatles were worth hearing. Ed Sullivan and his wife had just happened to be landing at Heathrow Airport on October 1963, at the same time the Beatles were coming home from Sweden, and was amazed at the sheer number of screaming fans that awaited them. So he decided to meet with Brian Epstein and offered to have them appear on his hit show... But Epstein pushed further with the negotiations, saying that the Beatles should make three appearances and that they should get top billing, even though they didn't have a number one hit yet. CBS had also decided to release a five-minute documentary on the group and Beatlemania, but unfortunately the program was cancelled due to the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas that very same day. When news came out that Sullivan had agreed to the deal with Epstein, Capital decided to be the sole distributor for the Beatles songs, especially due to the fact that some leaked copies of I Want to Hold Your Hand were now playing on radio stations outside of their control and distributions, and teenagers were starting to ask for more songs from this new group. Due to the overwhelming response, Capital decided to release I Want to Hold Your Hand three weeks early, where 1.3 million copies were sold in 10 days, and they began work on releasing with the Beatles, though it was renamed to Meet the Beatles and was trimmed down from 14 songs to 12. Cell Tape was also set up by Nicky Byrne to handle the merchandising rights in America, which it turned out would be a massive financial disaster for the Beatles, but I'll talk about how exactly in episode 7. The Beatles were currently performing to a fairly poor reception in Paris when they heard the news that I Want to Hold Your Hand had reached number one in the Billboard Hot 100 on the 18th of January, and while still in Paris, they recorded their next single, Can't Buy Me Love, in which George Martin was flown over from England to produce and join in the celebrations. 
They also re-recorded She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand in German because Germany apparently had said that they were not willing to distribute Beatles songs unless they were sung in their native language. After stopping at England for a few days, they were back in the air on the 7th of February, along with Brian Epstein, their roadies, Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans, John's wife Cynthia, and a few journalists, including their press officer Derek Taylor. When they landed in New York at the newly named John F. Kennedy Airport, they couldn't believe how quickly their popularity had grown, as over 4,000 people were waiting for them, each wearing a Beatles t-shirt to promote their visit. The American journalists, however, were determined to poke holes in them, but by now the Beatles had honed their one-liner skills to perfection. A few examples being when asked if they were going to get a haircut... I had one yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) That's no lie. Or why their music excited people... We don't know, really. If we knew, we'd form another group and be managers. Two days later, the group arrived at CBS TV Studio 50 and made their historic appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, garnering 73 million viewers for their debut, making it the largest viewing audience for American television at that time. That first trip to America was short but revolutionary, as the Beatles travelled to Washington, D.C. for their first concert at the Washington Coliseum, then back to New York for two nights at Carnegie Hall, before another appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, this time in Florida, before returning to England. Their success in America would spark off what would become known as the British Invasion, where many British pop, rock and roll and R&B groups would find success in America. These included the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Animals, the Who and Petula Clark. But also other parts of the entertainment industry were influenced as well, as many British actors like Julie Andrews found success in movies and many British shows were starting to be aired as well. But being the Beatles, there was no time to relax and reflect on the impact they had made as they had now started work on their next venture, their first feature film. Pop idols appearing in movies was nothing new. It had always been done as a cheap ploy to try and rake more money from soundtrack albums, and originally that was what United Artists intended to do with the Beatles. The director assigned to the movie was Richard Lester. And yes, it is the same Richard Lester who would go on to direct Superman 2, and subsequently Superman 3. Like George Martin, Lester had experience of working with the goons, and so the Beatles automatically respected him, as they found themselves in a mockumentary-style movie that chronicled the Beatles' lives through two days, and Alan Owen's script helped in cementing each Beatles' distinctive personalities. John was sarcastic and fearless, Paul was calm and trying to keep control, George was quiet and reserved, and Ringo was the lovable everyman. Ringo's performance in the film surprised everyone, particularly the scene where he wanders the canals on his own silently to an instrumental of this boy, the B-side to I Want to Hold Your Hand. Another sellout performance was from Wilfred Bramble as Paul's grandfather. I had briefly mentioned Bramble last episode, but I think it's time I explained more about him. Bramble was an Irish-born character actor who had become known as the devious and manipulative rag-and-bone man Albert Steptoe of the popular BBC sitcom Steptoe and Son, who apparently was chosen personally by the Beatles themselves. And for the American fans who were confused at the running gag of him being called a clean old man, that was a reference to Steptoe and Son when Harry H. Corbett, who played the son Harold, would often call Albert a dirty old man. You dirty old man. What a clean old man. Uh, Don't pressure, look. The movie also helped in creating a relationship when George took a fancy to one of the actresses playing one of the schoolgirls, Patty Boyd, and it wasn't long before the two started going out with each other. Prisoners? To go along with the movie was the album, which was, for the first time, an album made entirely of Lennon McCartney's songs, in which seven songs would appear in the movie, including I Should Have Known Better and I Love Her, If I Fell, and the previous single, Can't Buy Me Love. 
but they still needed a title. John recalls a moment when leaving the studio, Ringo had looked up at the night sky in exhaustion and said it had been a hard day's night. So John, liking the phrase, had gone home and came in the next day with the finished song, and so the film and the album and the next single would be called A Hard Day's Night. While they had been filming A Hard Day's Night, John had published his first book made up of his nonsense poems that had entertained him as a child called John Lennon in His Own Right, and it was a number one bestseller. And after the film had been completed, the Beatles got ready to embark on their first world tour. However, a problem arose when Ringo, who always had medical problems during his childhood, was admitted to hospital due to tonsillitis. Rather than postponing the tour until Ringo was better, they were told to go along as planned with a session drummer called Jimmy Nickel replacing him. Fortunately, any fears of them doing a Pete Best on him were dashed as John, Paul and George sent Ringo gifts as they toured Europe and Hong Kong and hoped he would get well soon. Ringo recovered in time to catch up with them in Australia as the tour continued through to New Zealand and back to Europe and Britain. They took a break from the tour to attend the premiere of A Hard Day's Night on the 6th of July, which was not only a commercial success, but a critical success as well, as the Beatles were now being praised as the new Marx Brothers, and Richard Lester's surreal directing made the song section stand out, and many claimed that this was the birthplace of music videos, while both the single and the album had both reached number one respectfully. Immediately after the world tour was completed, they were once again en route to America for a proper tour of the country, playing in San Francisco, Jacksonville, Baltimore, Denver, Cincinnati, and finally New York. Jacksonville was important because the Beatles had got wind of the fact that the audience was going to be segregated and they refused to perform unless it was changed. So to avoid losing money on this, the distributors agreed and the Beatles had it put in their contracts that they would not play to a segregated audience. Bob Dylan and his strong acoustic political songs had already made him an influential figure for many of the youth in America, and the Beatles themselves admired him. So when Dylan arranged to meet them at the end of their American tour, he introduced them to a new substance. Now, the Beatles were already smokers, but they had grown up hearing of the dangers of some of the stronger drugs, especially what Dylan was offering them, marijuana. Dylan was surprised at the fact that the Beatles had never taken it. After all, wasn't one of the lyrics in I Wanna Hold Your Hand, I Get High? The Beatles had to correct him and say it was actually I Can't Hide. But after locking themselves in their hotel suite and passing the joint around, the Beatles began to enjoy it and pot would now become a staple drug for them for the next few years. The experience also opened John's eyes to how he should write his songs, as Dylan explained how the best songs are the ones that have a personal significance to you, and John would take that on board. But while they were conquering the world, to the Beatles, the world had now shrunk to a dingy dressing room or a hotel room. In fact, there's a line in A Hard Day's Night that sums up the Beatle experience. Look it, I thought I was supposed to be getting a change of scenery, and so far I've been in a train and a room, and a car and a room, and a room and a room. That's really what it was like for them. The Beatles were now starting to feel like prisoners due to their fame, as they were always locked up away somewhere before they were needed to make their appearances. Also, the American tour had a problem that would plague the Beatles touring. Because of the limited sound quality of their amps, they were now starting to find it difficult to hear themselves over the loud screaming of their fans. It was also becoming quite dangerous and rather ridiculous. There were stories of girls trying to mail themselves into the Beatles' hotel rooms, police and their barricades were knocked over as girls would rush the stage, and in Seattle, a girl threw herself over an overhead gantry and landed at Ringo's feet as they were taken off the stage. The result of this exhaustion can be seen on the cover of their fourth album, Rush released on the 4th of December, fittingly titled 
Beatles for sale as the weary Beatles glared down at their out-of-control fans. For many, Beatles for sale feels like a step backwards from A Hard Day's Night as it goes back to the setup of their first two albums, only eight original songs and six covers. And sadly, most of the original material isn't some of their best, the only standouts being I'm a Loser, I'll Follow the Sun, and Eight Days a Week. But it still was a number one hit for Christmas, as well as their eighth single released before the album called I Feel Fine, which, for technical sake, was the first song ever to include guitar feedback on a single. The Beatles knew that The Who had experimented with feedback in their shows, but never thought to put it in an actual recording, and it helps in distinguishing it as one of the most famous openings for any song. But the pressure of having to balance personal and professional lives, having to crank out new material for a crazed fan base on a regular basis, would not go away for the Beatles. But before that, let's do what the Beatles couldn't do and take a break as we look at the second half of one of the most famous songwriting partnerships of all time, Paul McCartney. <laughs> 